Thanks for turning up for our talk on COVID-19 and veterinary practice. I'm Scott Weiss. I'm an internist, infectious disease specialist from the Ontario Veterinary College and the director of University of Guelph Centre for Public Health Synopsis. And I've been dealing with COVID-19 on the veterinary side largely since we started to be concerned about it. Uh, so what I'm going to focus on today is a little bit about the, the virus, a little bit about the disease, but a big thing on how it's impacting veterinary practice. If I can get our slides up and running. Let's try it again. Okay, I think we should be good now. Okay, so I'm not going to talk a lot about the virus and the background on the virus. We've all had a very good crash course in coronavirology over the last couple of months. Uh, but I do want to set the scene a little bit by explaining a bit about the virus and a bit about the human disease, because that helps us understand why we're doing what we're doing and why we have to do what we're doing to play our part to contain this virus. I'm going to focus on the animal aspects and on the veterinary practice aspects, but I'll spend the first few minutes talking about uh, the broader picture. So as you know, this is the classic One Health problem, the classic emerging novel disease. It's our third major coronavirus jump from animals to people in the last 20 years. And this is a virus that was related to the old SARS virus, and it moved from bats to people. We don't know if it was directly or through an intermediate host, uh, but it's been associated with the market in Wuhan. It's still a bit debatable whether that wet market was actually the source, but it originated in that area, ultimately from bats, and as you know, has spread you know, widely, and now it's a, a pandemic. So why are we worried about emerging pathogens like this? Well, you know, these slides kind of show it. Um, what happens when you get a new virus in a susceptible population where no one has pre-existing immunity? Well, it spreads very quickly. As you can see from that graph on the left, it's a bit old, but this is what emerging diseases do. They ramp up slowly, then they hit that exponential phase. And the impact of this has been you know, fairly variable between countries and even within countries. I know a lot of you are from the US. Uh, you probably know New York has been hit fairly hard. There are some places that haven't been hit as hard in Canada, Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia initially. So it impacts different areas differently, but no one's really escaping this. And the areas that have escaped it largely so far doesn't mean they're going to be that way in the future. So there are ways we can control it, but again, this is a, a highly transmissible virus in a highly susceptible population. Just if you want to know more about what it's doing internationally, this is from Johns Hopkins University. If you just Google Johns Hopkins and COVID, you'll find it. It's a graph and some data that show number of cases, number of deaths by area. This one's from a couple of weeks ago. It's one of the numbers you might recognize being a bit old, uh, but it's a good up-to-date reference on what's going on. And there's a lot of data out there about what's happening in different countries. Now, in the human disease, I'm not going to talk much about the human disease. Um, as you know, it predominantly causes severe disease in older individuals. It doesn't just do that. Young individuals can be severely infected. It's just less common. It's largely a child-sparing disease, which is good. Uh, kids probably play an important role in transmission. So even though they don't get serious disease, they're important vectors. But if we're looking at death rates and ICU rates, the biggest concern is the older population and people with pre-existing diseases, diabetes, respiratory disease, hypertension being some of the big ones. So these are the populations we're more concerned about. Well, we're concerned about everyone because anyone can get seriously ill, and even a person that doesn't get seriously ill can infect someone else that might get seriously ill. Now, we all know what social distancing is now, right? I think that's been very well explained. And this is why. So if you look at that line on the bottom, that's ICU capacity. And really, our goal isn't to prevent the absolute number of people that are getting infected. Our goal is to keep people below ICU capacity, people that need an ICU bed um, below the ICU bed capacity or the ventilator capacity. So that red line in the bottom is the ICU capacity from, this is from a British model from a month or so ago, but it still largely applies. Now that line has gone up because, you know, ICU capacities are being expanded, but it's not going up to the top. So it's moving up a little bit. So we have to do a lot because the problem is, you know, COVID's bad enough by itself. If you need to be in an ICU or you need a ventilator and you don't have one because they're all occupied, your prognosis is very bad, obviously. So in the do nothing scenario, you can see that black curve, that's bad. It's well beyond our ICU capacity. Uh, and you can see various things, closing schools, isolating cases, household quarantine, uh, social distancing of high risk populations. We can do little things that individually will drop that 
but it has to be a package. We can't just do one thing. You can't just close the schools. You can't just say we're going to keep sick people at home because while it have an impact, it won't have a natural an impact. And this is why we have to do what we're doing in terms of distancing and changing our practice. The other thing you hear a lot is flattening the curve, right? And you know, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep that curve below our ICU capacity, that curve of very sick people below the number of beds that are available for very sick people. But it's really not flattening the curve, really. It's you know flattening the waves. Because I think it's I think people are realizing it now, but this isn't something that hits and then goes away. This is something that's going to be here for a while. Because ultimately the way that we're going to control this as a population is through immunity. And that's either natural immunity or that's vaccines. Vaccines, you know, if we have a vaccine by next summer, I'll be pretty surprised. Just the time it takes to develop one, ramp it up, produce enough and distribute it so you can vaccinate 6 billion people, that's impressive. The other issue is through natural immunity, which is what we don't want, right? We don't want to get immunity because everyone got sick. And that will help to a degree, but put into perspective. So the US, there was just some stuff on CNN. So US passed a million cases. And let's say that's underrepresented by 30. Let's say it's actually 30 million, which you know wouldn't be unreasonable. That still means over 90% of the US population is susceptible. That's not herd immunity, or at least enough herd immunity to do anything. So we can't say, well, you know, by the end of the summer, well, if things are slowing down, we'll have enough immune people. No, we're still gonna have a highly susceptible population. And that's why we're gonna see measures that come and go. So in the veterinary practice, when we're getting into this, we're gonna see restrictions we have now, we're gonna see those get lifted, changed, not lifted completely, and it's going to go back and forth potentially. And that may vary by state or province or county or town. So as your rates go up in your area, there may be a direction, okay, now we have just urgent only practice or we're closing the schools or various other things to try to drop those rates down because they're inching up higher than we're comfortable with in terms of hospital beds. So this is something we're going to be dealing with for, you know, who knows how long, months, year or beyond that we're going to be changing how we practice. So a couple of things in the virus, this is relevant for how we handle infected or exposed people, and that ties into what happens in our practices as well. Incubation periods from the time you get exposed until the time you get sick, if you're going to get sick, is about five days, and that's pretty consistent with most of the studies that are out there now. The tail end of that, the upper end of that, it's a bit, you know, dodgy still, but it looks like the vast, vast majority will get sick within about 11 or 12 days if you're going to get sick. That's a fairly long period, but most people are going to get sick within that five to seven day period if they're going to develop disease. Now, one of the problems, and again, it's a good bad thing, right? A large percentage of people are getting asymptomatic infections, which is great for that person, um, but it means we don't identify the scope of the problem as much. And we have more people that are out there walking around because they have an asymptomatic infection or because they haven't started shedding yet. Because like a lot of respiratory viruses, like influenza, you can be shedding a lot of virus for a day or so before you start to feel sick. So we can't just rely on looking at people and saying, you look sick, so I'm worried about you, or you know, you're not feeling well, you have a fever. Those things are useful, but we can't just rely on fever checks to tell us that someone infectious is coming into our clinic or not. So we get that window of a couple of days, day or so before the onset of signs, and that four to six days after the onset, that's really the peak time when people are most infectious. But they can shed virus for, we don't really know how long, days to a couple of weeks potentially, mainly in respiratory secretions. And that's why we worry about masks and cough etiquette and everything like that, but also in feces. And the relevance of that isn't clear. Uh, and some of the animal data um, bring in some interesting questions about fecal shedding as well. Mortality rate, you know, pick, pick a number. If you look at some of the data from most countries, it's actually the actual number is like 5% that gets reported in a lot of countries. And I think the US is probably around that with 50,000 deaths in a million cases. It's not the real mortality rate though. The problem is we count deaths really well. We don't count infections really well. So our numerator, numerator is right. Our denominator is an underestimate. So two of 100 people that are diagnosed die, that's a 2% mortality rate but it's probably not just 100 people that had the disease. It might be 200 or 300 or 400. So the mortality rate is functionally much less than 2%. Um, but still, even if it's 0.5%, 0.5% of 7 billion or 0.5% of 300 million or 33 million in Canada, that's a lot of people. So even though the rate is low, the ability to infect a lot of people means the absolute number is high. Okay, so you may know all that. We're gonna talk about the animal issues now, both in terms of animal health and how we practice and how we protect ourselves 
and everyone else in veterinary practice because we're, we're targeting finding your grad, vet students here and we may have various people in the program but really you're entering veterinary practice in a completely unknown situation no one has ever gone into a veterinary practice like this where you're entering an era of social distancing an area where things are changing an era where we just don't know what's going to happen uh, their economic challenges the whole range of things that are happening so understanding some of these issues will help right the more we know the more comfortable we can be and it's still going to be a lot of unknowns but if you look at animal issues so we've got animal disease i'll cut, hit the animal disease aspect and it's not that big a deal as far as we know we have the animal as reservoirs and that's a concern so animals as sources of infection for people or animal reservoirs where they can be a longer term source of infection uh, and that's what we're concerned about ultimately what we really want to do by managing and investigating animals is keep this a human disease remove the animal equation through other research and figure out what the problem is or doing doing things to prevent animal exposure and animals sending it back but we have concerns about them getting infected. We have concerns about them being reservoirs. That could be reservoirs for other animal populations. That could be reservoirs back to people. It also could be a bridge to wildlife. And one of my main concerns for this is cat colonies, community cat colonies. And what we don't want to do is have a cat get infected in a household, expose a colony of cats who could spread it around the feral cat population and expose people, expose wildlife. Is the risk of that high? Probably not, at least the broader exposure, but we don't know. So we need to be a little bit concerned about it. Uh, management of pets of affected people. And this is a big issue for clinics, right? Because there are a lot of people with this infection. Uh, some of their pets are going to need care. So how do we manage that effectively, safely, protecting ourselves and doing the best we can for animal care? But other the kind of trickle down effects, the impact of social distancing on vet clinic or shelter or other animal operations, just how do we function in the social distancing era? And the impact of illness and self isolation on clinics and shelters. If someone gets sick and people are self isolating, that's obviously a problem. I know of multiple clinics right now that are shut down because of multiple people that have this infection and transmission that most likely occurred in the clinic. Someone brought it in, spread it to people. Uh, their co-workers and an outbreak that closed the clinic. And supply shortages. Um, how do we deal with limitations in personal protective equipment or PPE? And that's, that's still a reasonably important issue for us. Now, these are kind of good take home messages for me. You know, it's amazing how much we know about a virus that we didn't know existed until you know four months ago. It's amazing how much we don't know, right? It's not surprising how much we don't know. Uh, there are a lot of statements that just piss me off all the time, but there's no evidence of this. There's no evidence that animals can get infected. Well, deep groups said that at the start because there was no evidence either way. And oops, they can be affected. Well, there's no evidence they can get sick. Well, oops, they can get sick. We need to change the message. We have to be honest that we don't understand a lot of these things. And I think being honest is fine as long as we're communicating well and making sure that we don't freak people out. But we have to understand that we don't know everything. And what we know about this virus right now is different than what we'll know in a month or two months or even tomorrow. Um, but we don't have to have definitive information to act. We can use common sense, knowledge of infectious diseases, infection control. Um, we try to balance being prudent and being practical, and that's a big challenge. Um, but there's a lot that we can do in the absence of very clear information that says, thou shalt do this and that, and you'll be fine. And it's going to change, so the messaging will change, and that bothers people too, but we have to act reasonably. And generally, like a general principle of infection control is we're more aggressive at the start, and then we back off, right? It's better to be more aggressive at the start and then back off than to be too lax at the start and have to catch up or do damage control. So big key messages. And if you're gonna take anything home and talk to clients and whether this is on farms or in clinics or anywhere else, these are some key aspects. So keep infected people away from animals as much as possible. This is a human to animal disease. It's a zoonotic disease originally, but it's a human disease now, and almost all the circulation is human to human. So if we prevent human animal exposure with sick people, we're going to prevent any animal risks. We can't do that all the time, but limit that as much as we can. Keeping exposed animals away from other people and animals. If I infect my dog or my cat, but they don't see anyone else, who cares, right? We'll burn it off in our household together. A lot of it comes down to, you know, animals are people too. So doing what we do, and this is more for pets, but if I'm doing something with my wife or my kids, the same approach for distancing should apply to my animals. And I'll get back to that a little bit more. 
Uh, from a veterinary aspect, keep exposed pets out of clinics as much as possible. If you've got an animal from a positive household, you know, you got to convince me it needs to be seen in a clinic before it comes into a clinic because we can remove a few different areas of risk. Um, and I'll hit on that a lot more later on. And a big take home, you're more likely to get infected from a client than their pet. You're more likely to get infected by a coworker than a patient. So we need to pay a lot of attention to the human human aspects. Uh, but remember, there might be some pet to human aspects. And if anyone is gonna be the index case to find zoonotic transmission of this from a pet back to a person, it's probably gonna be a veterinarian because we're seeing multiple animals from multiple areas. Most people can contain their animals from other people very well, but we're the weak link there if an animal gets sick and has to come to us. And I guess one of my general goals in life is not to be an index case or a case report. Okay, um, some of you may be familiar with this. We have a website called Worms and Germs blog, uh, wormsandgermsblog.com. We have a lot of information there on COVID, pretty much something new every day. We have a lot of resource materials that have been developed. Uh, some of these are local, provincial, or Canadian, and some are broader. If you're interested in various things, um, check out the site. Okay, so back to the animal side a little bit more. What species can this virus infect? And we've been expecting this virus to be able to infect some animal species because it's closely related to the original SARS virus. And the original SARS virus was able to infect cats and ferrets. And importantly, cats and ferrets could then pass it cat to cat or ferret to ferret. So they're infected and they're infectious. Looking at the receptor this virus used, it's presumably the same one. It's an ACE2 receptor. And it's been predicted there are certain species that are high risk, non-human primates, not surprisingly, they're similar to us. Uh, cats are higher risk. Ferrets have actually been predicted to be low risk, which shows some of the limitations of predictions because we know they are actually quite susceptible. Uh, but there are various species with varying degrees of risk based on the receptors and maybe other facets. So this isn't, you know, people and animals as two groups. This is a whole range of animal species with different issues. Uh, I'm gonna talk about just our major species though. So dogs, good thing about dogs is they're fairly resistant to this virus or probably quite resistant to this virus. Experimentally, there was a small study with about five dogs. None of them got sick after experimental infection. I think two of them had virus identified in feces and they zero converted. So they had a real infection, but they didn't get sick. And I think that just reinforces what we're seeing with a couple naturally infected dogs. The disease is probably very mild or non-existent. There have been two dogs identified in Hong Kong. Just today, you may have heard of the dog in North Carolina, a pug owned by a pediatrician from Duke that has COVID in the family and the pug was positive as well. And it was completely unsurprising, right? We have this disease that's in people. We know there's some susceptibility of animal species. And when you live in close confines with your pet, we infect them sometimes. So it's causing people to freak out, but it really wasn't a surprise. So the take home for dogs is from a dog health standpoint, it's probably pretty much inconsequential. Uh, their ability to get infected is still there. They can get infected. We have no idea what that means in terms of their human risk. If we look to the Hong Kong dogs, there was virus isolated from nasal secretions. So that would suggest that, you know, there's live virus there. Is it enough to cause an infection? We have no idea. Dogs, I think, are pretty low risk. Can't say no risk, and we have to apply some common sense. Um, but I think they're low risk overall. Cats are a bit different story. So we have the original SARS, cats were susceptible. We know in experimental models, cats can be infected, they will get sick, and they can spread it cat to cat. With dogs in an experimental study, they didn't spread it dog to dog. Didn't mention that either. So this is again why we're more worried about cats. Uh, they can get disease. They get you know, typical upper respiratory tract infection and they may have GI disease at the same time. So similar to a mild COVID case in people. Um, will they get seriously ill? We don't know. There have only been a few cats that have been identified. So we're to, trying to avoid making you know, sweeping statements. I think overall, most cats to get it, if they get clinical disease, will have mild disease, and they're gonna be a typical upper respiratory tract infection. And they won't look any different than any of our run-of-the-mill upper respiratory pathogens. I'm more concerned about you know, senior cats, cats with various comorbidities, just like in people. Are they gonna be more likely to have a serious infection or a fatal infection? Probably. Um, only time will tell whether that's really a big deal. So thinking about uh, clinical disease in cats is something that's relevant for us. Cats can affect other cats experimentally. Uh, presumably means there's some degree of risk for us, right? If a cat has enough nasal secretions with virus in it to pass it on to a cat that's in a cage next to it, if someone's spending a lot of time with a cat in their face, 
um, you know, it, it seems reasonable. We have no idea what the incidence is. There have been very few animals tested. Logistically, it's a challenge. So we're doing surveillance. And for our surveillance, what it requires is me to identify a positive household, and then I need to go there because we don't want the people coming out. And we don't want the animals coming out. So we can't just say, I'll pop by the clinic and we'll sample you. We've got to go into the household. So there are a lot of logistical challenges, which is why there aren't many studies being done. So is it, you know, one percent, point one percent, twenty five percent of cats in households that have COVID that are infected, we have no idea right now. And it's something we really need to sort out for us down the road because we are going to be dealing with this virus for a long time and we need to figure out how to assess risk in our patients. Uh, ferrets are the other big species we're worried about. Ferrets tend to be quite susceptible to a lot of our respiratory viruses. They're susceptible to this one. They will get sick and they will spread it ferret to ferret. Good thing is, you know, their noses are small. They don't aerosolize as much. Um, you know, if you've got a ferret that's infected and you're sticking that ferret's nose in your face, certainly there's got to be some risk. We just don't know what it is. Some clinics are taking a very strict line with ferrets. So we're paying more attention to cats with acute respiratory disease, acute GI disease, and pretty much all ferrets. It has higher risk, but we do still see them. We just recognize there's a higher risk. And the household aspect is important. I'll come back to that. Livestock so far so good is the take home. We were worried about pigs um, because their receptor looked like it might be amenable to this. There have been, there's been a little bit of experimental study so far and pigs have not been affected. I don't think we have a definitive answer yet, but I'm much less concerned about pigs than I was a few weeks ago. Still want to keep infected people away from livestock because this could be devastating, even if it doesn't cause disease, just the, the PR, the paranoia aspect. If someone says, We've got COVID-19 in a pig, that's gonna be devastating to the pig, the pork industry, even though there'd be no food safety risk there. So again, we're trying to keep people away from animals if they're infected. Horses, we don't really know much about. I would suspect they're low risk. We do spend a lot of time working around their faces. We have a lot of kind of face-to-face, hand-to-face contact with horses. So we do need to be aware of that, but the risk overall is pretty low. Uh, just earlier this week, there was a report of COVID in two mink farms in the Netherlands, completely unsurprising. Again, mink are like ferrets, uh, same general family. It's not surprising if you have an infected worker, you can infect the mink. Uh, they got 20,000 mink on those two farms. So that's a crap load of mink and a crap load of manure to deal with. So they're dealing with how to, what's the risk? So how many mink are affected? How do we handle manure? A lot of things come down from this. So again, it's easier to prevent exposure and prevent a problem than to try to figure out how do we contain this virus on a farm, we have a lot of animals and a lot of manure and people coming in and out. So again, yeah, we're really focusing on reducing exposure. And then other species, who knows? Um, we don't know a lot. Poultry so far haven't been infected experimentally and that's good. It's not too surprising that birds wouldn't be affected, uh, but it's very good because the more we can see wild animals not being susceptible, the more likely we can keep it as a human disease or a human companion animal disease, as opposed to something that might sneak back into the wild population. Bats, if you look at areas, uh, a lot of countries are restricting activities with bats, restricting people going into bat caves, restricting research that involve bats. We don't know if our native bats are susceptible like the origin bat in China, uh, but we don't want to know. So if anyone's doing ecology, you probably won't be working with bats close contact in the next little while because we don't want to risk infecting a bat colony. Okay, so from a clinical standpoint, when to suspect COVID-19? Well, a lot of it comes down to identifying the household risk, which has limitations because of the high rate of asymptomatic infections and because people can be infectious uh, before they're sick. So, but we still try to flag that. Really, clinically, dogs, we're not likely to see it, I don't think. It's, it's early to say no, but I think it's less likely. Cats, where I really flag and there's a concern, and, and we're certainly getting reports of these, we're not getting testing on them yet, but the classic situation is you've got a person in the house with COVID, five to seven days later, the cat starts coughing and sneezing. It's an adult indoor cat with no risk factors for viral respiratory tract disease. You no, know, a new cat that comes into a household, an indoor or outdoor cat, if they, they're coughing and sneezing, you know, they've probably got one of our run-of-the-mill respiratory pathogens. If they're in a household with a inf human infection and they don't have those risk factors, then I think it's got to be high on our list. Uh, it can probably present just as GI disease. There was a cat in Belgium that was vomiting and diarrhea was the main pair of signs or the only signs. And young kittens and maybe seniors might be more severe, but we're still sorting that out. We said we've got a handful of cases identified internationally. Ferrets probably very similar to cats. So this is a big one. So a lot of things we need to do with, with COVID is you know, stopping people from freaking out. Um, you know, we want to maintain that human-animal bond. We want to maintain logical thought. 
and we want to be able to do our jobs right. So a couple of key things. If you're going to talk to clients, these are really important to, to hammer in. COVID-19 is spread almost exclusively or exclusively person to person, right? If an animal gets it, it's getting it from a person. So a person, if they're worried about their pet, if they call you up and say, I'm freaked out that my cat might have COVID, or my cat might give me COVID. I can tell you that I can pretty much guarantee your cat won't, right? If you socially distance your cat and your cat doesn't go outside, encounter other animals or other people, it's not bringing it into the household. The way your cat is getting COVID is from you or the human components of your family, which are a greater risk for the other humans in the household. So if my cat has COVID, it got it from me, probably is the highest risk person in my household or someone else in my household, but we pose a greater risk to each other than that animal does. And really the, the greater risk is me infecting my animals, not my animals infecting me. Now, if we don't socially distance, then yeah, it's a possibility. If those animals are getting out and encountering other people, then maybe they could bring it back into the household. There was one of the two cats in New York that were recently, identi recently identified. There was no known positive person in the house. So was it an asymptomatic infection or was it this indoor outdoor cat tracking it in? And that last part is concerning, right? If this actually was tracked into the household, um, that brings in a lot of extra issues. But if people keep their animals inside, if we socially distance animals, social distancing is a household activity. It's not a human activity, it's a household activity. If my dog and cat don't see other individuals, they are not going to bring it into the household. And that's the thing we need to keep hammering into people. Because it's a very simple thing to understand, and it's a very simple control tool, and it will make people relax. So for us, it's a little bit different, right? So if we've got an infection in the household, well, they could pass it on together, and the humans are greater concern. The animal's you know, not a big deal for them, that animal might be a big deal for us. When we're talking to clients, we can really downplay the risk. It's not downplaying it, it's being honest about the risk. That the risk posed by their animal is exceptionally low and it's basically zero if they apply some common sense. So what are the main pet associated risks? Um, well, non-socially distant pets bring it into the household. We have no idea what that risk is, but it's gotta be there. And then pets transmitting it out of the household. And that could be to other people, other pets, like I said, feral community cats, wildlife or us um, or groomers. So it's uh, anytime we anytime we get contacts between groups, we get risk, right? If we consider the household, the dog, cat, people, one unit, that's fine. It can pass it together. We want to keep that group separate from everyone else. The minute people start moving out or animals start moving out, we bring in some risk. Okay, does the virus survive in the environment? And that's kind of a dumb question because does the virus survive? Yeah, the question is how long does it survive? And it's an envelope virus. Envelope viruses are inherently pretty wussy. They die with UV light and desiccation and time and any disinfectant you wave at them. Uh, so it doesn't survive very long outside the host. If we look at some surfaces, plastic and stainless steel, two to three days was shown in this study. Um, you know, our pets aren't made of plastic or stainless steel or cattle or horses or anything else, but we don't know how that applies. So it's probably, you know, minutes to hours. I would suspect that, you know, if I'm infected and I cough on my cat and I deposit some, some respiratory secretions on him, well, that virus is going to stay there for a little while. Um, how long? I don't know. Not very long. And within the household context, it probably doesn't create that much risk. Where it does, if you got, you know, dad's sick downstairs and isolating himself and the rest of the family's upstairs, but the cat's going back and forth, well, that does pose a risk in that household. But from the fomite aspect, the risk is maybe again to us. We're bringing an animal into a clinic that has to be seen. And it's from a positive household and it's been handled by an owner that's sick and coughing. If they deposit something on that cat, that animal's hair coat, and then, you know, 10 minutes later, we're wrestling with it. Well, there's maybe some risk there. And that's why we're going to talk about handling animals from positive households. So can they be fomites? We don't know. Um, you know, certainly they could be in some situations. Are they any worse than a doorknob or remote control, anything else? We don't know. They're just another object that we can contaminate. But direct transmission is the bigger risk. So I think it's something that we pay attention to because we can't say there's no risk, but it's not something that I really freak out about. And we're looking at this in our surveillance. We're looking at how often their hair coats are contaminated. So if it is a potentially contaminated animal, what do we do? Well, the biggest thing is you know, keep going to the clinic, keep them in the house. And that's the take home all the way through. If we can keep exposed animals in the house, then that's all we need to do really. Uh, if we can't, well, time is our friends, you would agree, but you know, if it's serious enough that it has to come into a clinic, it's urgent, right? So we have to handle them. So it's the risk of that animal's contaminated coat is going to go down over time. But 
it's not like we're saying, okay, you got a pelvic fracture, I'm gonna chuck you in a cage for a couple of days and we'll see you later. It's not gonna happen. Uh, topical, so can we do something to reduce hair coat burden? Well, probably. Um, we don't know if we need to, we don't know how effective it is, it's gonna be safe. But if we can do things that are easy, cheap, logical, safe, why not, right? So it might be a bath, we can't bathe everyone, right? That pelvic fracture, we're not gonna bathe it. You know, the small hypo, you know, hypothermic kit, and we're not gonna bathe it. But we can bathe some, uh, we can apply biocide mousses or rinses, we can wipe them with disinfectant wipes. You know, this is like the disinfectant wipes that we use for surfaces, we're handling with our bare hands. So, you know, they're safe for contact. And we're talking a single wipe. When then we're talking a clinic context here, right? We don't want people hosing their animals down with bleach in the house because they're worried about them, right? We're talking a special situation where we've removed that animal from the high risk environment and brought it into our lower risk environment. We want to mitigate that risk. So if an animal comes from a high risk household, it's something to consider. We don't know whether it should be a standard practice. Uh, it's just something to think about and think about what you might do. So it's not recommended for routine use for you know, lower risk animals. It's not recommended in households, especially something like bleach, because people often mess up the concentrations. What are the odds your random clients infected and infectious? Um, pretty low overall, right? This is a pandemic, but it doesn't mean everyone was infected at once. So it's variable regionally. If you're in New York, it's different than if you're in Idaho. If you're in, if you're in Canada, it's different if you're in Toronto versus some rural areas that aren't as infected right now. Um, overall, it's really low. If they have respiratory disease, it's going to be higher. And as we move out of flu season, if they have respiratory disease, the concerns about COVID are getting higher and higher. But we can't say, like I said before, that if you're not, if you look healthy and you have a fever, you don't have this virus. Well, we can't really say that. So we can screen a little bit though, and this gets a little bit less useful now that we've removed some of our risk factors. So this is a, a, an algorithm we put out. This is put out in clinician's brief. We've updated it since the first one. And this is to identify risk. And basically saying, okay, there are situations where we might want to do something different with that animal. So let's query health status of the household. So is anyone sick with COVID? We have known COVID infected people. If we have someone that's self-isolating because they were exposed. If we have someone with a respiratory disease that might be COVID. Initially, we were asking travel. Travel history's kind of moved now. And then we can start to say, okay, do we you know, try to postpone the visit? Do we do it like normal or do we do it with extra precautions? So you don't have to do the exact same thing, but I think the concept is important to think about. And for all this stuff is being prepared. So the more we can know in advance, like the worst case scenario for a clinic is someone shows up and the animal's in there, then, oh, now we realize it's from a COVID positive household. Now we've got a backup, we've got to do damage control, we've got people that are freaking out and we're scrambling. If we know in advance and we can say, okay, well, there's the animal from the positive household coming in a half hour, here's what we're gonna do, we're all ready. We've got our gear on, we know where the animal's going, we know how the transfer is happening, people will calm down. And once you start doing it, you'll realize you can do it very safely. So the more we can plan in advance, the better. Uh, speak Russian, you got Russian version on the left. We got various translations if anyone's interested in pure in area with different uh, ethnic communities, um, might be useful. Okay, social distancing. Everyone's heard about social distancing ad nauseum, right? The concept is we wanna reduce the number of human, human or human animal, animal, animal contacts. We wanna reduce the duration and intensity of them because every contact brings in some risk of transmission. So the more often and the closer we do it, the greater that risk comes up. So can we do this in veterinary medicine? And that's a big question, right? I think if you asked them a year ago, can we stay away from owners and still practice? Um, you get a lot of pushback. And I think that we've shown we can. It's not optimal, but we have to balance protecting our owners, protecting ourselves, protecting our coworkers, and being responsible in an era where social distancing is important and when essential services are the only thing that's happening. So how do we do it? And again, we're just trying to remove that human-human contact point because that human-human contact is the main risk. So in a companion animal clinic setting or any in-clinic setting, the biggest thing is closing the waiting room. Don't bring people in the clinics. I think probably almost everyone's doing this. So it's choreographing how we do the transfer. So you show up, you call, we'll come out, we'll pick up your animal, and you you know pop the back of the, the van and we'll pull the crate out or we can do a transfer. This is where you have it planned in advance, right? So you know how the animal's coming in and you know that you or your technician is going out and what you're gonna wear. So it might just be a lab coat, a mask, cloth mask maybe, and gloves, it might be different for different situations. It might be, you know, they open up and they put the, the cage in the ante room inside of your clinic and they leave and then you come in. I know that some clinics have, have an area where the animals can be tied up. So they come in, they tie the leash to the door or put it on a hook, they leave and then someone comes in. So we can make that transfer, 
We can get all the history we need by phone, but we don't have to have close contact with the people. So the more we can keep that six foot barrier, uh, the better for us. And like I said before, we can screen for higher risk. Telemedicine, like if this doesn't change the approach to telemedicine and veterinary medicine, nothing will. And we're gonna learn what we can do effectively with telemedicine and what we can. We can't do everything. We're not gonna fix that pellet fracture, but there are a lot of things that we can do by telemedicine. And that might be completely taking care of the problem. It might be trying something and seeing what the response to treatment is. It might be something that buys us some time um, because you know we're not doing this forever. We're trying to do this now more strictly and then phase in. So it might be analgesics, might be empirical therapy of whatever. Uh, might be dropping off a fecal sample. There are a lot of things that we can do by telemedicine. Cohorting staff groups. Now this is useful to think about. It's difficult to do for a lot of clinics, but cohorts of groups, right? So we're trying to keep different groups together. So this, this you know, clinician, this technician, they work together all the time and they stay away from everyone else. A good exercise to think about this is think about a clinic you're going into or one you've been at, pick some random person and give them COVID. And then think about, okay, when public health comes in, if they come in and say, who has this person been exposed to in the last few days? You know, if it's everyone, you're kind of screwed. If they're gonna self-isolate everyone, your clinic is closed and everyone's exposed. If you can come in and say, okay, well, we're doing all these things with PPE and there's only been close contact with this person and we've got, you know, A, less risk to people, which is the big thing, but B, a greater ability to keep the clinic going because not everyone's gonna be self-isolating, hopefully. So it's a good exercise to think about. And then a lot of basic things, electronic payments only, limiting need for signatures. You learn a lot about informed consent and the importance of signatures, but signatures aren't you know, the be all and end all, it's getting consent. And I think a lot of regulatory bodies are opening up what they consider consent. And this is important to realize where you're going and what the rules are. Um, but documenting verbal consent is acceptable for most things in most areas. Uh, so you've talked with them, you write down, I got verbal consent from this person at this time. If it's a really, you know, if it's a contentious thing or you're worried about it, um, you can have someone else do it. So I get consent, okay, would you please repeat this to this other person or you put it on, I'm gonna put it on speaker, we're gonna get your consent for this procedure. Both of us heard it, both of us write it down. You know, that's as good or maybe even better than a signature. Uh, so knowing what happens in your area is important. Arranging food and drug delivery, you know, drive up, call, or plop in the trunk, off you go. It could be drugs, it could be food. We can get the care, support the animals and the owners without having contact with them. Uh, and the big thing is, you know, it's social distancing is populations, right? It's the household units population, the clinics a population. So if there are 10 people in this clinic, nine are doing everything textbook, but one's going to parties every weekend, that person's breaking the whole thing down. They're creating risk for themselves, but they're creating risk for the clinic, the family members of people at that clinic uh, and the clinic itself in terms of its ability to function. So being responsible and making sure people are being responsible is critical. We can't police everyone, but we've got to try our best to make sure everyone understands the importance because not everyone does. Even some very well educated people don't really understand why we're doing this. Uh, just one last thing on social distancing for small animal clinics. We made up this little video. It's available on YouTube. It's available on our website. Uh, it's just for clients. It's basically saying, here's how we're doing social distancing. So you call us. Here's how we do the transfer when you get to the clinic. Things like that. Just to reinforce, we're going to give your animal the best care, uh, but it's going to look different. So some clinics are putting that on their websites to give an idea of what's happening. Uh, farm, same concepts for farm visits. So screening the health status. So is anyone sick on the farm? Does anyone have COVID? Does anyone have a respiratory disease? Well, if so, do we really need to go? Might be one question. Can we postpone this? Or can we do it without anyone there, right? If you're a dairy practitioner, you need a preg chunk of a bunch of cattle, do you need some people on the farm? They're probably not. You know the farm, you know where you're going. Um, so we can maybe have no people there. Maybe we could have someone that's recovered. So if we look at people that are lower risk, the person that had COVID a month ago was maybe the first person on the farm. That's maybe the person I want there because they're very, very unlikely to be shedding. Uh, someone that's healthy, that's been distant from the infected people next on the list. We can start to figure out who's the lowest risk person. And then we socially distance, right? I spend as much time as I can more than six feet apart from that. If they have to hold for a procedure that brings us together, that's when we need to think about our PPE. So we can give them a mask, prevent them from shedding. I'll talk about masks in a minute. I can wear a mask and eye protection to protect me. And we just can be efficient. So one of the things about being practice is just, you know, planning and trying to make sure we limit the amount of time close together. Don't spend a lot of time chatting. Don't go back and forth because we forgot to do something. Make a plan, do it, step back, and we can still do our jobs. Uh, so limit the number of people overall, limit the risk of those people all, uh, as much as we can, and stay away. 
Mobile companion animal practice, same general idea. Screen the health status. If you got someone that's infected in the house, you know, do you really need to be there? Should you divert it somewhere else when needs critical care? Uh, how do we handle it? So is it, you know, the high risk person? Is it a single person that's actively sick and there's no one else there? That's a different situation than if you got people that are recovered or you've got people that are healthy. So um, you know, I did a couple houses recently. One was a single person who's sick and she's the only one. She's the one restrained for our sampling. And I was well PPE'd. Uh, another household had eight people in there. Only one was sick. That person didn't come near us at all. Everyone else was healthy. Maybe they're shedding up potentially, but they're low risk. So picking those low risk people to hang out with. And then think about the PPE, just like I mentioned for the, for the farm call, maintaining that gap, be organized, and thinking about where we do the work. So can we do it in the garage? The garage is removed from that person's living environment. It's lower risk for contamination, probably. Can we do something in the backyard or on a porch? Uh, depends on the species, right? Probably not gonna handle a cat like that. But if there are a way we can do it contained and safe, but removed from the people in the environment as much as possible. So then within clinics, right, we can socially distance, you know, with some exceptions fairly well from our clients, but how do we socially distance within the clinic? And that's a bigger challenge because, you know, if you're gonna put a catheter in a cat, someone's gonna be within six feet of you, absolutely. So we've gotta figure out how we manage those. So we, we limit that contact as much as possible. So this is just a matter of clinic design, how we move through the clinic, how we do procedures, so that I don't have to spend much time at all close to someone. If I have to spend time close to someone because I'm doing a procedure, then we plan it right. So I know exactly what we're doing. I've got all the stuff there, so I don't have to be pissing around and getting more supplies. We do our thing and then we step back. So we can still do it quite well. It doesn't mean we can't talk and interact, but we try to keep that distance as much as we can. Looking at cohort groups, like I mentioned before, looking at mixing areas, lunch rooms, offices, ways that let you, you know, get away, decompress, get your mask off if you're wearing a mask because no one's around and get some semblance of normal um, while protecting yourself and still letting the clinic operate. And a lot of it's good old infection control, like, you know, wash your hands, clean and disinfect, routine things that, you know, we often don't do as well as we should. A um, couple other things, just when you, if you're looking at social distancing and not necessarily just ambulatory clinics, um, but if you're dealing with an assistant, right? So if you're going in a mobile practice with a technician or a farm visit with a technician or assistant, socially distancing from that person's a challenge. So we, we can't maintain that six foot gap in a vehicle, we can wear a mask to reduce the risk, but with other things we can think about. So daily syndromic screening, just because I'm healthy doesn't mean I'm not infected or infectious, but if I have a fever, yeah, that's high risk. So making sure we're responsible. Do I feel off? I'm not going to work. Do I have a fever? I'm not going to work. Erring on the side of caution, being responsible, realizing that if you have to spend a lot of time in close proximity with someone, we're trying to protect their health and their family's health and their other contacts health. Uh, I, I'm going to hit the mask again in a sec, or consider wearing a mask, uh, to prevent you from infecting them and consider we consider eye protection or face protection. The less confidence you have in someone you're close with, the more PPE you should wear. If you think this person is not doing their job well socially distancing, then I'm going to be inclined to wear more PPE as a routine matter. Okay, now that leads us into masks. So there can be some confusion with masks and with any PPE, it's really important to remember why we're wearing it. So there are two main reasons we're wearing it. One is to protect us and the other is to protect from us and their masks cover both of those. So if we look at N95 masks, so these are high efficiency filtering masks. You're supposed to be fit tested, so you need to make sure that mask actually fits your face and works well. Most people aren't fit tested, but they're to protect me from inhaling this virus. So when I'm going into a household with positive people, I've got an N95 mask on because I'm trying to protect me, but if I'm trying to protect me with a mask, I also need to protect my eyes because it makes no sense protecting my mouth and my nose, those mucous membranes and not my eyes. So an N95 is part of a whole package to protect you from what's going on around you. Surgical mask is mainly to prevent us from depositing droplets and aerosols. So as I'm talking, I'm depositing aerosols and droplets on my keyboard. And the surgical mask would help reduce the risk of that. That's why we use them in surgery. They're not as effective as protecting me from inhaling something because they don't fit tightly. Now they'll help a little bit. And maybe the biggest thing they'll help with is preventing me from touching my face. So if I contaminate my hands, I don't touch my mouth or my nose, which I do all the time. So a mask will help prevent that. Cloth masks, you know, six months ago, who would have thought we'd be talking about cloth masks in a medical situation? Uh, but we are because surgical masks are very short supply. 
Cloth masks can be useful to protect from you, to contain your droplets, contain your aerosols. They're not going to be as consistently effective as a surgical mask. Their effectiveness is depend on their design and the material. Some materials will be better than others, but they're an acceptable alternative and they let us conserve surgical masks. So if you look at a lot of clinics now, it's required to wear a mask if you're going to be within six feet or just in general, and that's to protect everyone else, right? And that's where you need to think about it. If we have five people in the clinic and we want to wear masks, everyone needs to wear a mask because it's not like a seatbelt. I'm not wearing it to protect me. I'm wearing it to protect from me. So everyone has to wear it because the benefit has to be if everyone's wearing a mask. So if you're going to go with a mask policy, you really need to think about everyone wearing a mask. If we're trying to protect from someone else, that's when we add on a better quality mask or add on a face shield. Surgical mask and face shield is still a pretty good combination if and when N95s aren't available. But really think about why you're wearing masks. Um, and then what do we do when we're running out? So surgical masks are one of our bigger issues, and a lot of places you will not find surgical masks for a while. You know, production is being ramped up really well, um, but you still might be short. So in general, we think about kind of three different or four different areas, I guess. We think about um, conserving, like overall conserving through reuse, through extended use, through limiting the number of people that are using them, and then number four would be decontamination. So for conservation, well, it's, you know, if you don't need a mask, don't wear a mask. So if for a surgical mask, if we're thinking about surgical procedures, the surgeon needs a mask, people that are over the table in the surgical site need a mask, anesthesiologist doesn't need a mask. The technician that's coming in to check on the patient or coming in to bring in supplies doesn't need a mask, even though we've always been conditioned to do that. If you look at human medicine, in the UK, for example, it's uncommon for an anesthesiologist in a human OR to wear a mask because they're not over the patient or over the table. So there's no need to do it. So we can we can limit the amount of PPE we need by thinking about some situations and the number of people that are involved in those situations. We can also think about reuse or extended use. So reuse is when I wear something and then I take it off and then I put it back on. Extended use is when I keep wearing it for multiple patients, which I wouldn't do before. Uh, both of those are okay. Reuse the surgical masks is fine. If we're careful with them, we take them off, we don't crumple them up, you lay them flat, you don't tear the ties. You can wear them probably multiple days. We don't know how long. Uh, with N95s, we know you can reuse them multiple times without running into problems. Surgical masks, you know, they aren't quite as tough, but probably you could. And I'd rather have a surgical mask that we use once or twice in surgery than a cloth mask in surgery, for example. Uh, decontamination, you know, dry heat, it's practical. You can look at UV light, we can look at the radiation, peroxide vapor. Those are all things that will work and they're really being investigated well for N95s and human health care. We're not going to have access to those in a clinic. So if you really need to decontaminate, which you probably don't, but if you do, like dry heat, warming temperature in an oven, 150, 170 Fahrenheit, really for five minutes, really, but 20 minutes will really do the job. Autoclaving, I don't recommend. I just think the saturation of the water with that absorbent inner layer of the mask might cause problems, that heat, that pressure. I'm just a little wary of it. But realistically, this virus isn't going to survive very long on a mask. And we're not looking at a high risk contamination thing like dealing with a patient, in, an infected patient, if we're wearing a surgical mask. So I think often we can just reuse these, let them dry, be careful with them. So we can stretch our supply a lot. Uh, I mentioned cloth masks a couple times. If you want to make your own, this is a CDC. If you, if you Google CDC and cloth mask, face mask, you'll find these. So there's some sewing methods and some non-sewing methods that will let you make, you know, a tolerable mask. I wouldn't want to wear it with a potentially infected patient or infectiously infected owner, but for routine use to direct people from my aerosols, uh, it's a perfectly fine example. So like I said, for routine mask use in clinics, it, it's a reasonable approach when you can't maintain that six foot distance. Cloth masks are fine, they save our surgical masks, and again, remember, we're using them to protect from the wearer, so everyone needs to wear them if we're trying to handle that as a population level. So overall, with PPE, um, it's good to have a plan. Like I said before, people panic when you don't have a plan. If you have a plan, especially if you've practiced your plan, uh, it helps a lot. So thinking about different scenarios and what you're going to wear. So the picture up there is a practice run we did back in January when we were just starting to ramp up with my dog Merlin. So just looking at different types of PPE you can wear. Um, so this is a high risk situation. So this is handling an animal that might be infected or from a high risk household. And you see some differences just there. In human healthcare, they wear gowns, so surgical gowns like I've got on there. Uh, would work really well if you're handling a patient in a bed. And you can maybe see why it doesn't work as well for the dog because you can see my pants. So you can see those lower legs exposed. And, you know, I talk to people on the human side about, you know, sometimes we actually wear more like Tyvek if we're working with a dog because, you know, my patient's more likely to run around and lick my legs than their patient. 
and say, oh yeah, that's true. Uh, so we need to think about what's likely to be exposed when we're deciding what to wear. When I'm going into households to do sampling, I'm wearing Tyvek, just because you know you get there and that dog's coming up and it's slamming its nose into your legs and it's easy to wear a tie back. So, but think about what you're gonna use for a normal case, for a case from a high risk owner or a sick case from an unknown situation or a sick case from a high risk owner. And that sick case, you know, with a cat that's got respiratory disease from the positive household, that's when I'm thinking respiratory protection for me. So again, having a plan for those different approaches is useful just so everyone can relax and you know what to do. CDC just put this out the other day, CDC really, started off trying to downplay any risk saying there was no risk essentially at the start then all of a sudden came up with this uh there's some good stuff in their document there's some stuff that's not very practical uh, i'm not sure they had much clinical clinical involvement there they don't differentiate the species risk so essentially any cow with diarrhea is a COVID suspect which we know isn't the case so you have to kind of interpret you know COVID compatible symptoms or signs but if we see an animal you know aerosol generating procedure so working around the face of an animal from a positive household that has respiratory GI disease, that's when I want to go whole hog, N95 mask, eye protection, uh, good solid protective outerwear, as opposed to your healthy animal um, from an unknown positive household or a positive household. So thinking about how you would handle those situations, doing a risk assessment and thinking about the risk and also what your PPE availability is. Like, what do you have? What can you use? Uh, what are you trained to use? And for PPE, we don't, I think we do a pretty crappy job of teaching PPE. Uh, and, and I'm certainly including that. I just started doing it with, with our second year. It's just kind of, you know, probably in January, we started doing a little bit of PPE stuff because we never talk about it. You kind of, okay, here's a gown, put it on. Here's some gloves, take it off. That's kind of what you told in the fourth year. And there is a choreography here um, because you can wear PPE really well, use a lot of money in PPE, and then completely screw it up by taking the stuff off wrong, which you contaminate your hands. So this, this is an example. If you're going to put PPE on, know how to take it off is the, is the take home because there are different ways to do it, um, but there are some right ways and there's some wrong ways. And a good training exercise if you're going into a clinic and you have uh, PPE to do it is have someone put it on and then have them take it off with some people watching and watch and see what they contaminate. And I, I think I've yet to see a student do it where we say take the stuff off where they do it without contaminating themselves multiple times just because it's not something we've really thought about. So it's a good little training exercise to show some of this. So if you're going to be handling high risk cases, really, or if not, and this is just, a, it's easy. If you're working with salmonella, campy, who knows what, it's good to know how to take your PPE off properly. Uh, a couple of the PPE things, keep track of your inventory. No, you're not really going into managing a clinic right now, but um, PPE does disappear. And multiple clinics have lost surgical masks in particular because people are stealing them for their own use or to sell in the black market, who knows? but you need to know what your supplies are. So you need to know when you're running low and you need to know when you're going to be restocked. So if you're going in as an associate, know how many surgical masks are there. And then if you're running low, figure out, okay, when are we going to get some back? What's our supplier say? If they're saying, well, call us in September, nothing till then. Okay, we need to stretch our supplies. Whether that's changing what procedures we do, whether that's going to cloth mask for low risk procedures like a spay or a neuter if you're doing those. Uh, reusing them, but we need a plan. It's better of a plan than all of a sudden come in someday and technician says, we're out of masks and we're out of gloves and we're out of gowns, right? Then you're kind of screwed. So PP conservation, I mentioned this before, reducing the need, uh, reusing and, and extended using and thinking about PP alternatives. And we can do a lot of those things. Like a lot of, we can do, if we're looking at PPE to protect the patient for routine activities, we can bring in alternatives. We don't want to bring in as many alternatives to protect us. We're dealing with a high risk patient. But if we're thinking a surgical situation, we can bring alternatives that are pretty safe uh, and are practical. Surgical gloves are short supply in some areas are not too bad, uh, but again, knowing your supply. So if we get back to the situation where you're doing a lot of surgeries and you're running low on gloves, well, what gloves, what procedures do I absolutely want a surgical glove for? You know, implant procedure, a high risk infection or a high implication infection procedure. What are the ones I don't really worry about? You know, some field surgeries and you know, a lot of the bovine surgery if I'm doing an LDA, do I really need sterile surgical gloves or can I do something else? A, a neuter, probably a spay as well. Or can we do alternatives, which might be a nice tight fitting set of nitrile gloves where I put a hand sanitizer on. So a surgical hand sanitizer like Avogard or Strillium, like we put on our hands, putting them on a good set of, of examination gloves is pretty good you know and i wouldn't be hesitant at all to use that for a routine surgical procedure you know i wouldn't want to do it on a tplo where the implications are, of infection are pretty high 
um, but I would be comfortable with it for a lot of procedures. Exam gloves aren't too short supply. Um, if you are running low, again, you can reuse them. You can um, do extended use. This is a little not very scientific study I did with my daughter a week or so ago. Basically, we, we put hand sanitizer on or we hand washed um, with gloves. And we saw, you know, there was some puncture rate. You can see the, the picture on the, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here, um, my pointer, but you can see a little leak here. So this is a glove that was worn once, it was washed with soap and water, and we've got a little leak. Um, you know, it's not surprising. We know surgical gloves have micropunctures all the time. But I think what we showed is, is with this really non-experimental experiment, um, puncture rates were pretty low. So if you need to stretch your supplies, you can wash them. I think it'd be better to put a hand sanitizer on. We know alcohol won't damage the integrity of these gloves with at least a few uses. So you could leave them on. I just don't want to wear gloves a long time because we tend not to handle them right, and it's just pretty uncomfortable. But if you had to, you could wear them. So if you're going out repeatedly to get animals from a vehicle, you're doing the drop off and pick up thing, then you could wear those same ones and, and disinfect them each time. Uh, testing, we've got a couple minutes left. I'm gonna talk about testing and then try to wrap it up here. So um, testing is available in some countries. In the US it was rolled out last week, in Canada it was rolled out this week, in other countries it's been variable. Um, the question is, do we want to test or when do we want to test? For me, it's really good that we have a test, but it's a test I very, very rarely want us to use. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, you know, and I just in general don't want to do a test if it's not going to impact what I do, right? And information is interesting, but we don't have a specific treatment, so it's not going to impact patient care. And a ne single negative, we're not going to say, okay, it's not COVID, you don't need to do anything infection control wise. If we're worried about this in a positive household, then it's not going to change that much. There are some situations where it might be useful, might be interesting, but there are a few and far between. Where it's more important is surveillance, because we need to answer all these questions that I've been talking about before. How often are animals infected? How often do they get sick? So from the population level, it's important to know. So, you know, if we get a data dump from IDEX, for example, and they say two of 100 cats were positive, okay, we know the prevalence. But if I don't know anything about those two or about those 98, I can't put it into perspective. If we're doing surveillance, then I know a lot about the two and the 98, then I can know more. So what we're seeing, and you see this in the US, you see this in Canadian guidance is coming out, the emphasis is testing when there's an actionable response. And mainly that's under surveillance, so we can use the results. There might be some situations we want it clinically, but the thing is, every time we bring an animal out of a household, so we're focusing testing on situations where animals have a plausible exposure to COVID, right? Or to SARS-2-CoV. Um, and if that's the case, I don't want that animal out of the household if I can avoid it. So if it's at the clinic because it's sick and we're working it up, that's a different story since taking those samples adds very little risk. Bringing that animal into the clinic just for the purpose of testing, you know, it's an isolated household, so we've got to get someone to pick up the animal. So that's a contact point with the household, with the animal, then the animal comes into us, and that's a new contact point that's largely avoidable. So we're trying to encourage not just random testing. You know, testing needs to be done, trying to incorporate it with surveillance. The other thing is, you know, if you get a positive result and you're working with me on a surveillance thing, we know who to talk to, we know how to handle it, we know all the talking points. What you don't want to do is just get a result and you fax it off to the owner, email it off the owner saying it's positive, have a nice day, right? That's how people freak out. So I think there will be some indication to test. As time comes in and we learn more, there may be more indications to test if we're acting on some results. But we just need to know a lot more about this virus before we can figure it out. So I, I think I basically said this. Uh, the bottom point I think is important. If there's enough reason to test, you're doing it on the assumption there's a reason this animal might have this virus. So we need to use PPE, right? I'm not gonna say, okay, well, I should test this virus because I think it might have COVID, but I'm not gonna wear any PPE because I really don't think it has COVID, right? That just doesn't make any sense to me. If I'm gonna test, I'm gonna wear PPE um, that's gonna protect me during the test. And the other thing is, you know, PPE doesn't protect against bites. And I think one of the biggest risks I have with sampling is being bitten by a cat. I can wear a PPE, I can distance myself from the owner highly effectively if I wear my PPE right and I take it off right. Um, cat bites me through my glove and that cat's got an infection, well, maybe that's something I can't really avoid. So I think we have to be aware that there may be some clinic risks if we start doing sampling. So if a pet's infected, what do we tell the owner? Well, keep it at home, right? I don't want to see your animal right now. Sometime in the future, yeah, bring it on in. Um, but if we can handle it by telemedicine, if we can delay it, that's what we want to do. If you have to see it, then think about your PPE availability, your staff training, your staff comfort. If everyone's going to freak out, maybe you're better off sending it somewhere else. If you don't have the PPE or the comfort or the training, maybe you're better off diverting it if you can. 
And if you are going to bring it in, then you've got your plan. But the default is the animal shouldn't come in unless we can be convinced it has to. Just last minute or so, is veterinary medicine essential service? This is something you have to sort out where you're practicing because there are different guidelines or different rules. I can say for Ontario, where I am, veterinary medicine is an essential service, and that's fairly consistent pretty much everywhere. But we've also been told that it's urgent care only. So we have an algorithm you can see on, it's on our website too, kind of helping you figure out what's urgent. And you know, that's a very variable thing because there's some situations where something that might seem very benign or regular might actually be important and some things that aren't can be put off. So the big thing is, can we handle by telemedicine? Is there potentially a big impact on this animal's life or welfare if we don't do it right now versus wait a couple of weeks? Um, and there's still a lot that we can do, but there are a lot of things that we can postpone. So understanding the approach of your practice and understanding the rules in your area, and that's going to expand over time, right? We're going to go from just urgent to bringing in some important things and then bringing in some less important things then bringing in everything. So we're going to have a multi-step rollout back to normal. It's kind of from a long-term thing. Think about this for a sec. So overall in veterinary medicine, what's our highest risk procedure? Let, let's ignore ferrets because ferrets are, are small numbers uh, for most practices. What our highest risk procedure is probably dentistry and dentals on cats. Uh, just because we're working, we're aerosolizing, we've got a species that we know can have it. Um, we have no idea what the occupational risk here is, but there's, there's probably got to be some. So with that aerosol generation, that close contact, the potential for punctures of gloves, I think it's just a reminder that we need to pay attention to household risk. So a lot of places aren't doing dentals right now, A, because of concerns about the risk or just because we're only doing urgent things. But if you are doing them or you get to do them, that's when you know querying the exposure status of this household. If you got a whiff, there's something wrong with this household in terms of COVID, delay it for a couple of weeks, unless this is you know, an urgent issue. And then think about our PPE. I just grabbed this from a, a web page, but you can see they're wearing gloves. They've got a lab coat on. We've got a mask and there's a face shield and eye protection. And, you know, it's pretty routine stuff and it makes sense, but we tend to be pretty variable in our approach to infection control. So a good general reminder that we want to protect ourselves from any aerosol generating procedure, not just in terms of COVID. Um, down the road, this is where we find out more about cats. You know, if we find out a lot of cats are subclinically infected, maybe we think about testing before our dental. I think we're way, you know, advanced at doing that. But we start thinking down, how do we maintain our practice during this longer period? period where we're going to have still potential of owners being infected and exposing your animal. So we got a lot of questions we're still trying to answer. Really quick on disinfectants, anything kills it. The th thing you need to do for a disinfectant to kill this virus is actually get the disinfectant on the virus. So we need to use them properly and actually hit areas. But if we do that, any routine disinfectant is going to work. Hand washing versus hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizers are short supply. This is a still distiller we've been working with in town. They've been producing thousands of liters of hand sanitizer instead of gin. Um, you can make your own hand sanitizer if you have different types of alcohol in your clinic. Uh, hand sanitizers are as effective as hand washing. Just whatever one you can do and will do is the key. And I think I'll just end up with this slide and then kick to the end. So this is something we're running into. Um, you know, someone has an animal with COVID, or someone has COVID and they have an animal and they've had to go to the hospital or they've died and they don't have someone else to take it in the household. What do we do? Um, and this is tough because we don't know exactly what the risk is, right? So this, and I've written something on this before, again, if you want to see it on our website, but I kind of prioritize who I think is ideal. So ideally we keep the animal in the household. So it depends on what's happened to that owner, if they're just hospitalized and maybe coming home or whether they're not. But if we can care for that animal in the household, that keeps it, you know, it's one less contact point. And ideally, if we had a family member that was sick earlier and is recovered and is probably, you know, immune, hopefully immune, that's a great situation. We can maybe transfer it to a recovered person to their household who doesn't have susceptible people there. So the neighbor who had COVID or the, you know, the, the family member had COVID and is recovered, that's a good one. Care in the home by someone else who's already been exposed. Um, you know, if they're self-isolated, maybe it's the neighbor who can walk over, but someone that's, again, we're trying to figure out who's at low risk for getting getting disease, who's at low risk for getting newly exposed, or who's at, who's at low risk for getting serious disease. So what I don't want to see is, you know, someone taking the cat and they've got elderly people or high risk people in the household. So we need to think about who the risk uh, applies to, and then ultimately it might be at that clinic or it might be a shelter. And there are kind of developing, established and developing guidelines on how to handle these in shelters. And it's a tough thing to do with shelter capacity for isolation, but how do we effectively isolate these? And the, the standard line is we isolate them for 14 days, uh, in which case if they're infected, they've probably burned it off. 
And if a client wants to surrender or euthanize their animal, again, talk to them. Like I said at the start, remember, if, you're, if your pet's infected and got it from you or someone else in your household, the biggest risk is, is from you to your pet, not from your pet to you. There are some issues we need to pay attention to, but with some common sense, people don't need to worry about their pets infecting them. Key take home messages, social distancing is the key outside of the clinic, inside the clinic. Um, we're going to get back to normal, but it's not going to be, you know, flip a switch and we're back to normal. It's going to take some time and it's going to go up and down probably in what we're doing. You know, a lot at the start, we're getting a lot of this, oh, it's an overreaction. No, it's not. Um, this is clearly something we need to do and it's something we need to keep doing. Is there an end in sight? Yeah. Um, you know, I can't say when, um, but it's going to be over eventually and we might be back to a bit of a new normal. And some parts of that new normal may be good. This may change how we do some things uh, in practice and outside of practice. They're actually good in the long term. And it's going to bring in some long-term hassles, absolutely. But there is an end in sight. It will get better. It just may take some time. How do we get through this? Well, social distancing. You know, I keep saying that, but it's true. Uh, adaption, adaptation, and, and resilience. And you know, as veterinarians, we're good at this in general. Um, there are some major challenges, you know, economically, socially, mentally, health-wise. There are a lot of things that we're dealing with right now. But in general, we're an adaptable community. Um, and that's, you know, we have to be adapt, we have to be resilient, we have to be tolerant, we have to kind of fight through some of the issues, but, you know, we will. Uh, just to end off, there's my email address. I spend a good chunk of my day doing emails. If you have a question about COVID, if, especially if it's a clinical question, or if you have a general clinical question, put urgent in the title. Uh, I get a lot of emails, but if you put urgent in the title, I make sure I get to it as quick as I can. If I don't email you back right away, email me again. Don't be afraid to chase me, but don't hesitate to track me down. If you have any questions, uh, more than happy to, to answer any questions you have about COVID or infectious diseases in general. So with that, I've taken you a little bit past your time, so I apologize for that. If anyone's still around and wants to ask questions, I think we've got Jane there to help moderate things. Let me get my screen thought, shared off. Great. We have a number of questions. I'm going to shoot them through. Can you see that I've been publishing where everybody is from? Can you see the area there if I publish through some questions um, to the side? I will try. Just give me a second here. I gotta... Sure. I'm not getting that. Uh... It's a little Q&A. Yeah, I'm just not seeing it right now. Maybe start asking and I'll see if I can find it. Sure, it says, is there any evidence of what the RO is for COVID? I've heard around three, but then I've also heard that there's one closer to one because of our underreporting in cases over representation of deaths. Yeah, great question. So R not. So this is the the, the reprodu reproductive number. So basically, for anyone who don't know, R not is the number of people the average person is going to infect. So if R not is one, that kind of keeps it steady because that average infected person hits one more infected person. If it's two, we're spreading. If it gets less than one, then it's dying out. Um, there's not really one R not for the virus because it, it's it's situational. So R not, if we, there's some data from Ontario very recently, R not provincially uh, was estimated to be just a little bit below one or rate at one, and that's because of social distancing, right? There's not an inherent R not. It's it's the whole practice. So if you've got a situation where you're containing things really well, your average person isn't able to infect someone else, and that's how you drop it. So your R not gets low. So we're seeing, you know, if you look at the U.S. in some states that are getting ready to open up, their R not is going to go up inevitably because they are creating more situations. So in general, if you kind of just say broadly, someone has to pick a number, what's R naught? You know, that 1.7 to 2 gets tossed around a lot in a somewhat controlled environment, but your R naught in a nursing home is going to be a lot different than your R naught in the population. So I don't know if I really answered that, but one of the things that we're really trying to do with all these activities is to drop that R naught down below one. Still not getting that come up for some reason, Jane. So if you want to fire away another question. Um, a fairly lengthy question I just tried to send through to you about um, dental practice and doing fracture tooth or oral oral masses. And they're concerned about asymptomatic patients uh, with unknown COVID status and the risk for staff um, doing dental procedures. So they were looking for some information about uh, intubation and then routine exams. They want to know We'll see the exact question. So it's right, a long, longer piece. Uh, so I can find it. There. So basically, and dentals are kind of what I was getting to there is we, we don't really know. Um, dentals are aerosol generating procedures. Absolutely. We intubate. We're around their face. We're using equipment that aerosolizes. So I think screening the owner situation is really important and it's not definitive. So knowing they're from a high risk situation really emphasizes the need to be careful or to postpone it. 
you know, some things we can't postpone. If there's a pain issue there that we can't control, um, we need to do it. And that's where you need to think about what you can do. So if you've got a positive household, then we're going to be careful. If you have a, you know, concerned, you know, household that you, you're not sure what's going on, then you have to de decide of how aggressive you want to be, really. And if it's a household with no known COVID risk factors, that's understanding your area. So if community transmission is low, asymptomatic infections maybe aren't that common, but we still want to, I think, do a better job than what we've done in the past. So for me, you know, face and eye protection is mandatory for any dental, should be mandatory for any dental now and forever, because there are a lot of things we can get exposed to that that's going to help protect with. It, it, it's an easy thing to do. Um, it's when do we pull out respiratory precautions, which is an N95 mask and eye protection. And part of that comes down to if you have supplies. So it's a very vague answer. I'm happy to chat through case by case stuff, but I think if you've got what you know is a high risk situation based on the disease in the household or the epi in your area or the animal is sick, then we really think about postponing. And if we don't, we go to respiratory precautions. If we don't have anything that indicates risk factors, we still want to go with our basic level of, of precautions, which is going to be mask and eye protection, which is still going to give us very good protection, but it's not absolute. And that's why we just really don't know right now what to say beyond that. So we, have, we thank you, Scott. And we have another one about thoughts on students coming into clinics. Is there any word about bringing them bringing them into clinics in the in the near future? So you're talking undergrad students that are doing probably students, veterinary students that are still in school, especially yeah. vet students. So yeah, so I think you're going to see restrictions on that still for a while. What we're trying again to do is limit the number of contact, and, and it's it's tough because we want to get people into those situations. And this is something that's applying everywhere. You look at co-ops and you look at residency programs, interns, uh, things like that is, is what's really required and, w and what can we back off on a bit. Um, it's going to vary with the epidemiology in the area. It's going to vary with the approach to the area, the clinic, how well people can socially distance. And it depends where you're coming from too. So if you're, you know, if you're traveling across the province, or if you're traveling to another province or another state, there's a reasonable chance the expectation will be you self-isolate for 14 days anyway. Uh, in some places, that's going to be mandatory. So it's going to be highly variable. I think we're not going to be able to say you're going to be in clinics June 1st or July 1st. It also may be clinics will or will not want you. Right? Because if you've got a clinic that's concerned about it or they've had some problems or they know people that have been closed down because of COVID, they're going to be less willing to bring in any risk because you are bringing in risk. Every new person into a clinic brings risk. And I think what you need to do if you're talking to them is, is just assess out the situation and I think engage early to say, okay, what are you going to expect from me? I think the more you can convince me that you're low risk based on what you're doing now, based on you're being responsible, you're asking questions about this. If I'm comfortable, you get it, right? And you know when you're going to pay attention and you're going to socially distance. And you're in a situation where you can do that. You're not, you know, living in a house with eight other people that you're running a room while you're doing your externship. All those things I think will help. But I think talk early and just be, be aware that it's going to be flexible. So do you have time for one more question? We have yeah. a number of them mm -hmm. here. People are not leaving. I can stick around as long as you want. Stick around? Yeah. Okay, so we have a question about um, small respiratory droplets hanging in the air. And is six feet really an appropriate distance? Yeah, great question. Um, we have no idea. Uh, if you look at World Health Organization, they say three feet actually. CDC says six feet, Canada kind of says six feet. It really varies. Um, it's a balance between protection and practicality. Now, typically what we're worried about is droplets and aerosols. So droplets are big drops that settle out very quickly. Um, that's the splash zone you can pretty much see. Aerosols are smaller, and, but they're still not going to go six feet uh, unless you're really forcefully coughing maybe. And it's not an airborne virus. Now, there's, there's been some conflicting evidence that's out there suggesting it's maybe airborne. Um, you know, I'd say that overall the perception still is this is aerosol and this is droplet and part of it's practical too, right? Because you can say stay away, stay six feet away and you can actually do that in a clinic most of the time, at the grocery store most of the time. If you say 15 feet, it's not going to happen. And one of the things we have to deal with with infection control is, you know, picking our battles to a degree. Because if I say everyone has to stay 15 feet away from everyone else, People are going to say, well, piss on that. We're, we can't do it. We're not going to do it. So I'm not going to bother anything, right? It's not, well, okay, I'll do six feet because you say 16 feet, 15 feet. It's going to be, that's crazy. We're not going to do it. We're maybe not going to pay attention to other stuff. So six is pretty good. Um, it's really hard to effectively evaluate that though in a field situation, right? So if I get COVID, did I get it at the grocery store? Probably. Was it from a surface? Was it from someone I passed? 
closely as someone that coughed right as I came around the corner. We have no idea. But I think this is a truly airborne virus like measles where I, someone's in the grocery store and, and they cough or they talk and they put it in the air and it stays in the air for a while. We'd see a lot more clustering happening. Um, so I, I don't think it's a huge airborne risk. So on a more positive note or just getting your insight, what questions come in uh, about what positive changes will come from this pandemic? And that's a great question. And I think we're going to see, depending if you look at society or veterinary medicine. So in veterinary medicine, I think we're going to see some change. I think we may get more awareness of owner health uh, in terms of keeping sick owners away from us. So curbside, you know, would have what a clinic six months ago have said, okay, if people have flu like disease, we're going to do a curb drop off. They say, no, it's not worth it. It's a hassle. We can't do that, yada, yada. Now it would be pretty easy. Okay, if you're sick, just call us. Like, I don't care if it's COVID or if it's the flu or a cough. I don't want it. So if you're sick, hey, can we bump it? If we can't bump it, let's do the curbside drop off. I think we're going to see changes in telemedicine. Like I said, now, if we don't adopt telemedicine, to some degree, based on this, we never will, or at least it's going to be a long time because this is the perfect situation for us. We may see, and I think we're going to see that in human health care as well. And hopefully we're going to see a little more attention, awareness of infection control. Um, just the routine things that we need to do. PPE, how to wear it properly, when to wear it, wearing eye protection for dentals, washing your hands, things like that. Um, all the routine things and just an overall greater awareness of zoonotic disease and the One Health side. The One Health side has been a huge disappointment because once this became a human disease, no one gave a crap about One Health to a large degree. Uh, groups were basically saying, okay, well, it doesn't infect animals um, without even looking at animals. So I think there's going to have to be some retrospection saying, okay, well, this is going to happen again, right? We've had three major coronaviruses jump within the last less than 20 years. Another one's coming somewhere and we'll look at changes with respect to how we interact with wildlife. We're looking at maybe changes with food production in China, whether they follow through, but they've come up now with a list of species that can only be farmed uh, and exclude a lot of animals that you'd find at wet markets. So we'll see how long standing the changes are. Typically, we see that people don't change very long, right? You get a big event, people get freaked out and they get revert back to normal. This has been such a big event and from an economic standpoint, it's been such a big deal. We may see some sustained change societally. We actually, you brought up meat production and there was a question earlier. I had published it over, so I'm just going to find it here. But do, are there, is there currently testing happening, I believe, in um, in meat packing facilities? Like what is, go what is going on there when you come to meat production? Well, testing of animals and testing of meat, no, we're never really not worried about that. It's like we're worried about people in meat packing facilities because there are a lot of people and they get close confines. And that's a big issue internationally is you get, you know, a sick worker and they infect a lot of people and that shuts a facility down. Um, like I said at the start, doesn't look like livestock are susceptible or very susceptible. We're still working on that, but it doesn't look like it's a big risk. Even if they were, the odds of this contaminating meat would be pretty low. And the odds of this being alive by the time it made it to a person would be basically nil, I think. This is a weak virus. So if you look at how food is handled, how it's cleaned, um, time issues that are involved there, I don't think we have any real concern about this being a foodborne pathogen. Um, the biggest risk from meat is probably the package of meat that you touch in the grocery store that someone touched right before you and put back down. Um, so it's that human contact after processing that's probably the big concern. Um, Great. Great. Thank you, Scott. So for going back to students, since we did originally talk about this talk being for students, we have a number of people interested in if, <clears throat> if students can't work in clinics this summer, what recommendation, maybe I guess this would be from the college even, um, that how students can get experience. I mean, they're all every year students are trying to build their experience between yeah. academic years. So what options are there out there for students right now? I think it's tough. Um, I think telemedicine experience could be actually very easy depending on your clinic. And again, if, you, if you're supposed to be going to a clinic and you can't or being delayed, one of the questions is, are you doing telemedicine? And if you're doing telemedicine by Zoom, you know, you can add in one person really easily or by Skype, you can add in one person really easily. If they're just doing it by phone, it's maybe more of a challenge. But there might be some ways, at least you get some experience to see how things are done in telemedicine. It gets your brain thinking about this case, right? You're getting the history. Okay, what would you do? I, I think there could be some really valuable things. You're not getting your hands on the animal. You're not doing surgery. Um, but I think you can still get a lot. Um, there are ways, you know, colleges are providing information. VIN has a lot of good information. It doesn't help with the hands-on component, but at least getting your brain thinking a little bit differently than just a lecture 
will help. And I think part of it is brainstorming and asking us what we can do, right? We have limited bandwidth for adding on new things. But for me, you know, I've been talking to Ben about how we do some more infectious disease stuff or antibiotic or case things that way um, that we <laughs> were talking about because you aren't getting the same degree of clinical experience. So I would say be creative and think about how you can drive some of this stuff. Clinics are busy, right? And they're not thinking about this, but if you can come to a to clinic with an idea saying, okay, how about you do telemedicine by Zoom or whatever, I'll, I'll help you set up your telemedicine platform if I can be in all the appointments. You know, clinics might be thrilled with that. So we do have a, number, a couple of questions about getting started with telemedicine. Are there any recommendations about getting getting into that or just? Um, there's some there's some resources on it. So there are telemedicine platforms you can use, and then there's just the homebrew approach where you use Skype or Zoom or FaceTime, whatever. Yeah, there's uh, lots of stuff right there. I, pardon me? There's lots of free platforms like we all yeah. adjusted to right there. <laughs> yeah, I think there are, there are a lot of options out there and part of it's playing around and seeing what, what you like and what works. Really what you need is something that's reliable and has a good connection and you can talk to someone. And, and I'm not an expert in telemedicine by any means. So I think a lot of it's, again, we're going to learn a lot about how to do it. But I think is if you're doing telemedicine, default to try it in a lot of situations. Try it in cases where you think it's not even going to work. Because um, then you might reinforce that, yeah, it doesn't work in this type of situation. Well, hit by car, no, we're not going to do it, right? But, uh, well, maybe a hit by car that's really stable. You know, someone's freaked out because the dog came in limping and it might have gotten hit by a car. Okay, well, we can talk you through a little bit. And if, if nothing else, we're more prepared for when the animal gets here. But there are a lot of conditions that we can work through. So I think just trying telemedicine, getting a handle on what cases it works well, thinking about how we do things. Um, a lot of it comes down to, you know, are there ways that we can make it easier for clients to give us good information? Video, like, do we have good descriptions, canned descriptions of, okay, we need to, we need you to do this. We need you to do a lameness exam. So here's how we want you to shoot the video. Instead of spending five minutes trying to talk to them, okay, I'm going to shoot you an email that has exactly what I want you to do. You take the video and you send it to me, as opposed to us spending a half hour saying, okay, now we want you to do this. I, th I think be creative. Um, and now, now is a good time because the other thing is clinics that are slow, we've talked about is it, some clinics are really busy um, because they're taking up the slack from others. Some are busy because they're going with fewer staff, um, but people that are there are really busy. If you're a clinic that's, that's not that busy, now's the time to try stuff. We've been talking about, okay, now's a great time to work on some of your SOPs or some of your training things. Now is always a great time to pr play around with new platforms and for, because like we are going to get busy. Like the economy isn't fundamentally destroyed. The economy, you know, is, is being hit very badly. But there are a lot of animals that are going to need dentals. They're going to need vaccination. I mean, heartworm tests. We've got lameness things that haven't been looked at. We've got a whole range of elective and quasi-elective things that we may get flooded with. So the more we can make it efficient for when that happens, the better. So take advantage of some of those things. And, you know, it's tough for a new grad to go into a practice and be innovative because, you know, we like the way things are, right? This is the way we've done it. This is the way we're doing it. This is the time a new grad can go into a practice and be really innovative, especially if you like tech. So you can say, okay, well, how about we try this? Or, you know, I'm an externship student, so maybe I'm not going to spend much time doing any hands-on stuff, at least for the start, but, you know, I know how to use whatever platforms, or I can figure out how to use it. If you're interested in doing this, you know, I'll be your telemedicine coordinator or I'll think about that. Like, I think we've got an opportunity for new grads and students to come in and actually affect change that would be really difficult in the past. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for your time tonight. Um, if you if there are any questions that we didn't cover, I will post Dr. Weiss's uh, email in the comments and you can email him directly. And are there any final words that you would like to leave with or? No, I just say thanks for coming out. Be, don't be afraid to ask questions um, but about this or in general. Right? As we as we evolve, there are a lot of questions to ask. And if there are things that people need to know, we try to come up with information materials and guidance. So um, the more we know what you want to know, the more it'll help everyone. But thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thank you.